John this morning, continuing the series on holiness. And this is my, uh, my one slot in the holiness series. And I uh, could not have picked a better book to get to teach from. So thanks to Pastor Jared for this assignment. I uh, love two random letters in the New Testament. When people ask me what my favorite books are, uh, which doesn't happen very often, to be honest. But if people were to ask me, hypothetically speaking, what are your favorite books in the Bible? Uh, at this season of life, it'd be 2 Corinthians and it'd be 1 John. I love 1 John. And 1 John is the reason I fell in love with the uh, NLT. Uh, when I read 1 John in the King James, I can't say that I ever really grabbed much out of it. It's just interesting in the wording, the way John writes and the way it was translated. But in the NLT, uh, the first time I read 1 John, I wept. Um, I told some pastors that I was in Israel with a group of pastors, and they were there was a couple of guys who were you know only King James, and I said, "Hey, just got a challenge for you. I want you to read First John and the NLT." And I said, "I don't know if it'll just happen to you, but for me, I wept." And they texted me the next day and said, "Read First John last night and uh, cried and uh, and can't believe I've I've been missing out on this." So it's just a uh, um, a wonderful book, and, uh, and then in the translation that we often teach from, um, I love the way it is, uh, it's laid out, so simplistic. John's not a complicated preacher. He's not a complicated person. Uh, this John, who wrote this letter, is the um, uh, disciple whom Jesus loved, and um, also, at one point, was a bishop at, in the city of Ephesus. And if you come to faith way much, you hear us talk a lot about, you hear me talk a lot about um, uh, Ephesus because we've talked through Ephesians in 2021. And um, there's so many things that happen in that city that resonate with um, our culture today, in my opinion. And uh, John pastored there. So if you want to know what it's like to sit under John as a preacher, you need to read First John because he covers some themes repetitively in this letter, very simply. Love Jesus, love each other, keep yourself pure from the world. Love Jesus, love each other, keep yourself pure from the world. John had listened to the heartbeat of Jesus. He had laid his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. And he identifies himself throughout his gospel account as the disciple whom Jesus loves. And this letter reminds us that when we are in love and abiding with Jesus, we will keep our hearts right by keeping our hearts and eyes fixed on him. The whole theme of the letter, 1 John, this letter, is fellowship and uh, fellowship with Jesus. It's John who writes the most detailed account of Jesus' last discourse before his crucifixion. And that discourse, John 14 through 16, is about fellowship with the Father through the indwelling Holy Spirit and uh, abiding in Jesus, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. If you dwell in me and my word dwells in you, you will ask for whatever you want to. You will ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15, 7, paraphrased. And um, so John understood and wrote in a very thorough way this idea of abiding, which um, is not a word that we necessarily use very much in 2022, um, uh, I'm going to go to my house to abide for a while, or I, I abide now on 2nd Street. So uh, dwelling or living or staying in fellowship or in community, that's our buzzword, right? Church growth buzzwords, community. Um, being in community with Jesus. So we have this idea of fellowship. So what we're trying to do in this holiness series, uh, one of the goals is to look at the different ways that the b- biblical authors discuss holiness. And for John, we see that holiness comes through or comes from fellowship. It's a byproduct of fellowship with Jesus. So you don't make yourself holy to get to Jesus. As you spend time with Jesus, he produces a holiness in you. He produces a strength in you and a desire in you. He produces the want to. If I've done one thing that's in pastoring and counseling that's, wanted me to, that's made me want to bang my head against a this pulpit or against a brick wall. It is trying to get people who have no relationship with Jesus to live holy. Uh, it is a, 
uh, frustrating task. And uh, what you're doing in that sense is trying motivational tools. You're really trying the weapons of our uh, uh, carnal weapons, and and that doesn't work. Um, We need to be um, confronted with the grace of God and then brought into a loving relationship with Jesus, and that's going to produce holiness. And, uh, and we've seen such beautiful definitions in, uh, in, the, in Romans and Corinthians throughout the Old Testament uh, from, uh, from Jared and Rusty and Dustin in recent weeks, and it's quite a series. Uh, this morning's lesson is very simple. I think if I made it complicated, it would be a disservice to the letter. Uh, it's 14 statements going through the entire letter, 14 different ways that fellowship affects us. And as you see how fellowship with Jesus affects us, I believe you'll see a new light uh, on this idea of holiness. Um, God is holy, and he uh, is making us holy. And uh, in 1 John, anyways, we see the light on holiness through this idea of fellowship. So, 1 John 1, and we're going to read the first four verses. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we've seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us or then he was with us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. So I'm telling you this so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things that you may fully share our joy. So I am joy-filled because I saw and I touched the man who is the Word of God, the Word become flesh, and I am in fellowship with him, and I'm writing you this so you can have fellowship with us. Now, you can know me and know my Lord Jesus and know our Father, Abba. That's the idea. So statement, statement number one, we have fellowship with Jesus and it has given us a contagious joy. We have fellowship with Jesus and it has given us a contagious joy. A contagious joy. When you're in his presence, he brings you joy. Knowing you've been with him produces a beautiful joy. So John wants to share that joy, uh, share that happiness. Uh, Paul writes uh, uh, some of the most difficult explanations of what he's been through, and then he talks about his joy. So joy isn't always that you're in happy circumstances, right? But joy is a fulfillment and fullness of the heart. And I believe that it is very difficult for us to live in holiness without joy. And, uh, and so he, he starts this letter off, and I believe he builds and circles back around in this letter and making a case for this idea of fellowship. Uh, I have joy, and I want to share it with you, and it comes through our fellowship. We go on to verse 5. This is the message we've heard from Jesus, and now declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. If we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So fellowship with Jesus, number two, produces holiness. Fellowship with Jesus produces holiness. God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. If we have fellowship with God, we will not go living on in spiritual darkness is the idea from verse six. So there is a humility and a repentant spirit that is required to walk in fellowship John quickly deals with Pharisees here as he writes and simply says, if you don't think you're a sinner, then you're a liar, you're in darkness, and you can't have fellowship with Jesus. But 
there's much more to the book. So this is not a license to sin. This is not a go ahead and keep on sinning because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It is an acknowledgement of our fallen state and how if we will um, uh, recognize that, um, we will uh, acknowledge it and repent of it, then we can move on. And as the letter builds, the letter shows us that we don't have to stay living in sin. Um, uh, this is a, a beautiful way for us to, I think 1 John 1, 9 does speak to more than just salvation. I think it speaks to staying clean before God. God is always willing to, to, uh, to come back and to wash our feet as he did for Peter and the disciples, uh, to wash us anew and keep us clean. But we can stay and walk in a greater level of cleanliness through fellowship with Jesus. Uh, then, uh, number three, fellowship with Jesus produces obedience. He says in verse one, I'm writing the, or, uh, verse one of chapter two, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. Verse three, it, we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. As John speaks, he leaves very little room for gray areas. There's no pragmatism with him. Um, if you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar. If you're not obeying God, but you say you're following God, you're a liar. And uh, he doesn't pull any punches here. Fellowship with Jesus produces obedience. As I spend time with the Lord, I see what he has done. I see what Father God is doing, and uh, I want to agree with that and participate in that. Uh, the obedience isn't necessarily a command all the time as much as it is often a picture. It's a, a vision of what he's doing and an opportunity to walk that out here on earth as it is in heaven. So in fellowship with Jesus, I have a contagious joy and as I turn to Jesus, I begin this journey of holiness. Confess your sins. He's faithful to just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. So now I am spotless and pure, right? I have a, a white robe. And now and I'm wearing this new white robe, I want to walk in obedience with the Lord. The more time I spend with him, the more I understand what he is doing and the more I want in on what he is doing. And so... Verse 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Just a parenthetical statement here. Um, uh, doing what Jesus did is once again hammered home uh, outside of the Gospels. Uh, here in one of the latest uh, and, and most recent books of the New Testament, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, um, we know from descriptions from the Apostle Paul and obviously from the Gospels themselves that Jesus knew no sin but became sin for us. We do see that Jesus is a spotless and pure lamb, that he is a holy person. So living like Jesus did does not just mean um, casting out devils and healing the sick and preaching the kingdom, but living like Jesus did also is walking in the holiness that is given from the Father. And so we're called to uh, live as Jesus did. Growing up, in different, different places, different services, I would hear people talk about the impossibility of living fully in the holiness of God, the impossibility of walking in the character and nature of Jesus. And no one ever took the time to then tie it to things like, with God, all things are possible, though, right? It was always on this side of heaven, we'll never be, right? And, uh, and, and, and I understand why they're saying that, but I think that uh, it really lowers the bar for us, that it gives us a justification that the Scriptures don't give us. Uh, John is so black and white because John has seen the impossible become possible. If I saw a virgin have a child and that child be the Messiah, the sinless Lamb of God, who walked on water and made blind eyes see and then laid down his life to save all of mankind and then rise from the dead, then I think he can make a sinful person person like me, holy and sinless and spotless. It's not just a, a, a picture. It's not just a, a vision of one day, but it's a reality of today. You can walk in holiness. What a foolish thing it would be for Christians to argue about whether we should keep sinning or not, or whether we will keep sinning or not, to resign ourselves to failure when God gives victory. And when theologians take it and say, well, are you, are, are you talking about sinless perfection? I'm talking about holiness in the Lord. John here is not worried that one day people will parse his words and divide. He is worried about explaining who Jesus is and what Jesus expects of us. 
And so that's what we want to do first. Sometimes we get our theology ahead of our Bible knowledge. And you had Bible classes or Sunday school classes before you ever read the Bible through. And so we're preconditioned sometimes to uh, avoid meanings that are clearly laid out in uh, this passage. It's very simple, especially in the NLT. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Well, we can't do that with God. All things are possible. Um, Number four, fellowship with Jesus produces a love for all believers. So we're four points in. We have one point on holiness. Well, actually, we have four points on holiness. I believe if you're holy, you'll have joy. If you're holy, you'll be obedient. If you're holy, you'll love your believer. If we are critical of other believers, judging other believers, condemning other believers, we are not holy. Um, God is holy, 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 and God is love, right? So if we are unloving, then we are not holy. Verse 7, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment. I mean, he's talking about commandments as old as Moses, right? Love the Lord thy God with all their heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are, these are the commandments that go all the way back to the law. I'm not writing a new commandment. It's an old one. You've heard from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before, yet it's also new. Why is it new? Because it was impossible to love one another properly until Jesus came. And when Jesus came and he poured his spirit out, now it is possible to love one another in a proper way. It was impossible to be holy under the law. The law was a schoolmaster that took us to task for our sin. But when Jesus came and fulfilled the law, he made holiness possible. And so we we see this beautiful balance of holiness and love in the letter. Purity and love in this letter. Uh, Purity and unity. Purity and peace with our brothers. That's what we see throughout the letter. And it's it's a, a powerful, powerful call. It is also new, verse 8, because Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it, for the darkness is disappearing. That should be crocheted on a pillow. I love that. Or put on a wall. The darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. The darkness is disappearing. I like that. That's, uh, just shout that at the, at the enemy. The darkness is disappearing. If anyone claims, verse 9, here's another black and white statement. If anyone claims, I'm living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Real simple. I'm in the light. How do you feel about that pastor? I don't like him. You're in the darkness. No, no, no. But look at this. this, No, no. It's just real simple. Here's your metric. If you hate another believer, you're in darkness. Period. If that believer is your wife, if that believer is an in-law, if that believer is a different denomination, if that believer is a televangelist and you hate him, you're in darkness. But look at my works. Your works mean nothing. Without love, your works are empty. Without love, you could have faith to move mountains, right? And you go right back into 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 ties in beautifully with 1 John because you can have all the gifts, but if you don't have the character of Christ, specifically the love of Christ, then your gifts are hollow, empty, useless, and fruitless. So fellowship with Jesus produces a love for all believers. When you're with Jesus and you bring up a believer, you'll hear things like, I love that man, Right? And you're with Jesus, and you bring up a a brother. I love that man. I died for that man. When you ask him what he thinks, you'll see holes in his hands, and you'll know what he thinks about that person that you're struggling with. So fellowship with Jesus produces a love for all believers. This is like a reminder I need on every day that ends in Y, right? I need this reminder. Like, oh, you love them too. They don't love me, (laughs) but you love them, Lord, and I need to love them. And uh, and so that, that walking this out is so powerful. And then All of a sudden, John just takes a break, and he gives this parenthetical statement. There's no place in your notes for this. He just says who he's writing to. So in the middle of the letter, just stops. It's just a reminder, and it's a prophetic address. So, you know, if if you're if you're writing a letter to your son, if I write a letter to my son, you know, Clark, and uh, um, at the age of of nine, I say, uh, you know, to my mature young man. Who, uh, who, who handles all of his responsibilities well. If I, if I lay out this description of him that he hasn't quite lived up to yet because it's a description of a, of a 25-year-old, but he's only nine, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm laying out a vision for him, a prophetic a way for him to see. And that's kind of what John does here. 
I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. Now, is anyone here really mature in the faith? Uh, maybe, maybe he really is uh, writing it to it, but, but there are people still fighting with the evil one. There are people who are still not quite mature in the faith. And so they're getting this letter and he's kind of building prophetically for them who they are. And he kind of circles back around. He's redundant in, uh, in this address. Verse 14, I've written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who exists from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. And so it's this reminder, just driving home identity of uh, spiritual maturity, of spiritual victory, and of fellowship with the Father. And then he goes back to his instructions. So it's kind of like he starts the letter off, why he's writing it, and doesn't address it to anybody. And then all the way in chapter two, he stops and says, oh, by the way, this is who it's for. It's for those who are young in the faith, those who are old in the faith, and anybody who the Father loves. Let me say it again. And he says it again. Uh, verse 15. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. But what about, no, there's no room for but what abouts in John's writing, okay? If you hate a believer, darkness is in you, regardless of what you say. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you, regardless of what you say. The world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. So what do we get? Number five, fellowship with Jesus causes us to reject worldliness. Fellowship with Jesus causes us to reject worldliness. And this is chapter 2, verses 15 through 29. To reject worldliness. These things are not from the Father, but from this world. Anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. But the world is fading away along with everything that people crave. So John shows the spirit of the world is... And is supplemented or, or is sustained by the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of the world is producing this spirit that's coming out, and it's a spirit of anti-creator, anti-Jesus, right? It's uh, everything that is anti-holiness. And so the, the spirit of the world has produced this Antichrist, um, someone who is contrary to Jesus, an alternative to Jesus. It produces idolatry and impurity and a rejection of truth. And we, uh, as we walk with Jesus, we want to reject worldliness. This is the part of holiness that I grew up hearing, and it is a legitimate part of holiness. Holiness is to separate from the world. It is a, a touch not the unclean thing, but be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians. And uh, it is loving not the world. The other things that are in the world. If any love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All is in the world. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So holiness is a separation from worldliness. Now, worldliness, people get real pragmatic about defining worldliness. I think the fruit of the Spirit really gives us a great glimpse of what godliness is in contrast to worldliness is. And so if we have love and peace and joy, we have a metric that is godliness. The character of Christ is godliness. And if we are selfish, self-centered, um, and uh, um, uh, all about our own needs, then we are unloving. If we are filled with fear, and we are fear-mongering, and we are spreading and in love with violence, then we are anti-peace. So the fruit of the Spirit helps us kind of see what godliness is, and that helps us define worldliness. So that, that, that really helps us get away from saying these specific actions are worldly, or where Wearing this specific clothing is worldly. No, worldliness is anti-fruit fruit of the Spirit. It's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and so he ends chapter 2 with this idea that fellowship with Jesus will cause us to reject worldliness. I think of Peter who, who gets the greatest haul of fish he's ever gotten and all of a sudden the thing he's always wanted to be to, have the, to make the great catch, to be able to show all the other fishermen on the shore that I caught the big one. And not just the big one, I made the big haul. I caught so many fish my boat almost sunk. I caught so many fish that two boats almost sunk. I caught so many fish that my nets almost broke. I caught so many fish my business is the number one business on the sea. And as soon as he gets that, as soon as he, all of that, this 
is the greatest accomplishment financially and, and, and career-wise that he's ever had. He, he has sees, sees Jesus, or he has seen Jesus, and so he leaves it. They forsook their nets. They left the hall. They left the boats, and they went with Jesus. Fellowship with Jesus. All of a sudden, everything you've wanted and craved and desired, that you've been greedy for, that you've longed for, that you've coveted, all those things just pale in comparison to the beauty of Christ. Jesus, you're beautiful. And so he sees Jesus, and he just drops it all. He didn't leave a bankrupt business. He left a business that had everything. He left a business that was successful. He left a business that had just had the greatest catch ever. He dropped it and he followed Jesus. So rejecting worldliness is not just rejecting sin. It's rejecting the values of the world, the value system of the world, and going after a new way of evaluating uh, your worth in life through Jesus. We go to chapter 3. 1 John 3, 1 uh, a life verse here. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. See how very much our Father loves us. He calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Verse 2, dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. So number six, fellowship with Jesus produces a deep longing in us to keep ourselves as pure children of God. I want to live like I'm in the Father's family. I want to live like I'm one of heaven's children. So I want to keep myself pure. I long for Jesus to appear. The more time I spend with him on this side of the second coming, the hungrier I am for my faith to be made sight, for my, for my spiritual sight to become a physical sight. The more I see him in worship, through revelation, through the Holy Spirit, through dreams and visions, the more I want to see him get his full reward to sit on the throne of earth, to bring the throne of heaven down to this earth, to bring heaven down on earth, to have full dominion and authority over the earth for every knee and every t- to bow and every tongue to confess. This is what we long for. And as we long for it, it keeps us pure. There's something inside of us, a desire, a hole, a God-shaped, God-sized hole in our heart. And as we go to Jesus, he fills that desire, he fills that longing, and we cry out for him to come. And we work and toil and pray and worship and intercede to prepare the way of the Lord for him to come. Like John the Baptists, we are uh, hoping and, and longing and announcing his arrival, waiting not for the lamb to come, but for the king to have his rightful place. And we see it breaking through and it makes our spirits cry out. And we declare the miracles and wonderful things we see. We see it breaking through. In a, and, and, and when blind eyes see, we cry out, the king is coming. And when someone trusts the Lord, we cry out, the king is coming. And when someone is set free, we cry out, the king is coming. And it makes us want to stay pure because look what he did. Look what he's done in this house and how he's impacted people and set people free and healed people and empowered people and look at the gifts he's poured out on people and look at the spirit of prayer and spirit of worship he's given this house. As we see that, we long for more of it and we commit ourselves in greater measure to purity. If we don't see it, if we're not in fellowship with him, if we're pursuing other things, we're not hungry for it. You know, you tell some people that the blind are seeing, and they're like, huh, really? Must have been a misdiagnosis. Right? There's no happiness. There's no, there's no joy. There's no earnest expectation for the kingdom to be culminated, to be fulfilled, to be complete. So fellowship with Jesus produces a deep longing in us to keep ourselves as pure children of God. Uh, we know this practically, right, in like an hour of prayer. And maybe some, some days it's the five-minute mark. Some days it's like the 45-minute mark. You hit a place where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, we're, we're together now. The flesh has been subdued. I've, the veil has been thinned, and I'm with you. And in that time, there's nothing you want more. You hit that place where you're with him. He's speaking, and it's like there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a string in your heart that's being played that only he can play. Right? There's, a, there's a, 
a, a, a taste that your soul is tasting that, that you've never, that nothing else can satisfy. And everything else that you've tried to satisfy with just looks so trashy and cheap. But now you're in him. You're buying gold from him. <laughs> and the gold you've obtained before is just so worthless. It's just metal. But, but the wealth I get, from the unsearchable riches of Christ and the indescribable presence of Christ, this is what I've longed for. And when you get that, you have this longing for more. This longing for more. And there is more. So much write a book, call it that. Verse 11 of chapter 3. This is the message. By the way, yes, we're reading the entire letter. Uh, I've only skipped a few verses, I think. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not like we must be not <laughs> we must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. I, never, I don't know if I've heard a sermon like that. Don't be like Cain. Someone should preach that. Uh, don't be like Cain. Why did he kill his brother? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So I was in the prayer room a couple months ago. The Lord gave me a couple of visions about persecution and suffering, and uh, one of them was uh, I had just had a picture. Of Cain, I probably a picture that I saw in a movie sometime, or I don't know, maybe it was from the Lord directly, but I think it was, it was just Cain, just some like shadowy cartoon kind of form, uh, hitting his brother with a rock. And the Lord saying, since the beginning of time, uh, people have despised proper worship. And it was just so simple. And it was kind of like, Ken, this is like the first Bible story you learned. Why are you frustrated that people are upset about your worship since the beginning of time? Brothers, right? Family, brothers have been killing brothers because of proper worship. So when I said, blessed are those who lose land or lose family for my sake, I meant it. I meant family. When I said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? I said it because my brothers didn't believe me. My mother thought I was crazy. So since the beginning of time, brothers have been killing brothers over their worship. And right here, John says it this way, and this is the note, uh, fellowship with Jesus will attract a hatred from the world. Fellowship with Jesus will attract a hatred from the world. Nick Ripken was a missionary to uh, Somalia for 10 years. When he got there, there were four people he knew who were saved. When he left, the four converts he knew had just been killed. He left a country after holding thousands of dead bodies and ministering to a, a, a place that was just awful, just, just a place where no infrastructure existed, where 80% of the UN donations were stolen by rebel militia. He was left with 20%. He was tasked by America with his little organization to do the feeding for all of Somalia, and uh, it was, they were just overwhelmed. He, uh, he left heartbroken and defeated, and God's next call for him was to travel the world and see how the gospel flourishes behind uh, under intense persecution. He wanted to know how people can succeed in such a way with the gospel that persecution stops. But by the end of his journey, he realized that the number one cause of persecution is people getting saved. And if I want persecution to stop, that means people will stop getting saved. He realized that persecution is caused by uh, a revival. And uh, so we should stop praying that persecution will stop. We should just continue praying that people will come to know Christ. He met a man who'd been in prison for 13 years for uh, preaching Christ in China. And uh, he was telling him how he felt like, you know, he should maybe tone it down a little bit and try to avoid this, uh, this uh, you know, going back for a 14th year of prison. And he looked at him and he said, Nick, I suffer for preaching the gospel here. So you can freely preach the gospel in Kentucky, which is where Nick is originally from as a pastor. I suffer here so that freedom can uh, happen elsewhere. And he realized that persecution is a uh, reality of following Jesus. And if we're persecuted in the name of Jesus, we should rejoice. He told the story of meeting a man who had been in prison for several months and was malnourished because of the abuse they were putting. And so when his mom, or I'm sorry, when his wife and his son visited him in prison, the guards literally carried him to a table and laid him on the table because he could no longer walk. And he looked at his son, who I believe was eight or nine in the story, and his son teared up at the sight of him. And he said, Dad, I'm so proud of you that you would keep your love for Jesus in these circumstances. He looked back at his son and he said, son, I'm proud of you. And if I hear that you've been arrested for going to church, 
I'll rejoice. And if I hear that you continue in your faith, despite being arrested, I'll rejoice. And if I hear one day that you and mom and your sisters have given your lives for Jesus, I'll rejoice in greater measure because I know that this is what God has called us to. Nick left just heartbroken and, and, and so convicted because there are Christians all over the world in places like Russia and the Ukraine, where right now Ukraine uh, missionaries to the Ukraine are in trouble because Russian forces are gathering at the border for another war and Christians will be targeted. Uh, Christians in Afghanistan and Iraq, Christians in China and India, Christians all over understand something that we American Christians don't because we haven't seen it up close and personal. And that is that fellowship with Jesus produces a hatred from the world. A hatred we face is like a social media post. The hatred we face is uh, um, a little bit of scorn and um, not quite being uh, fitting in in society, but the hatred they face is imprisonment and uh, uh, um, uh, torture and, in some cases, martyrdom. In China, your seminary is prison. They don't trust you as a pastor until you've been arrested, and every pastor um, that Nick met had been in prison for at least three years. Uh, he met a group of 150 pastors, and they'd been in prison for, uh, all been in prison for at least three years, some for 30 or 35 years, but all of them were joy-filled over the report that the gospel was in other places besides China. This is the first they'd learned of it. They knew Jesus and loved Jesus in a place that was so far from the Middle East, in a place that is so culturally different than what we have in America. They were in love with Jesus, and they knew that fellowship with Jesus means the world is going to hate you, that you're going to be beaten, you're going to be questioned, you're going to be in interrogated, that there's going to be a darkness over you, but yet there is no place for fear. No place for fear, because fellowship with Jesus produces such a love inside of us. So it attracts a hatred from the world. Number eight, fellowship with Jesus will create a willingness in us to give up our desires, our possessions, and even our lives on behalf of our brothers. Verse 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Give up our lives for brothers and sisters. Now, this is not just a call to martyrdom. In fact, that's probably not the primary meaning. Right? A call for enduring, living, sacrificial love. Need a good marriage verse? Here it is. We should give up our lives for brothers and sisters. If you can't give up your life for your spouse, not going to do not going to do very well fulfilling this passage anywhere else. Give up our lives. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? <laughs> Verse seventeen. It, it's better in the King James. It's, it's far less convicting because it's, it's just a little wordy. You don't get it. And then I'll tell you, it's real plain. If someone has enough money to live well. That's me. And I see a brother or sister in need but show no compassion. God's love can't be in me. That's, I mean, like right between the eyes. I mean, does the American church need a, need a verse? Boom, right there. Right. Should, we have a, should we have a missions call right now? Uh, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So fellowship with Jesus creates a willingness in us to give up our desires, our possessions, even our lives on behalf of our brothers. Then we continue with verse 19, the, the, the point number nine. Fellowship with Jesus will produce a confidence that allows us to boldly enter into his presence through the Spirit. Verse 21, dear friends, if, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. We must love one another just as he commanded us. And those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship in him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. We give up our desires, our possessions on behalf of our brothers. We, we have a confidence then that allows us to boldly enter into his presence through the spirit. Number 10, fellowship with Jesus produces a clear understanding of truth. So chapter 4 then goes into testing the spirits. We can't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. We must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. How would we do this? Through the Bible? Yes. But through fellowship with Jesus. If somebody uh, comes to my wife and says, 
I heard Ken say this. She has a pretty good idea of whether that's something I would say or not because of the amount of time we spend together. When you spend a lot of time with Jesus and then someone says, I heard Jesus told me to do this, you might think, it doesn't sound like Jesus. That's, that's not the one who I read about and who speaks to me. Uh, you know, so we, we, whenever election season comes around, I feel a lot of this because I, I, I hate the union that so many American uh, 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 Christian leaders make with, with different political sides. I understand the issues, but I think the issues are bigger than uh, political agendas. I hate to make abortion about politics. Um, and, uh, and it seems like all of a sudden people start talking about abortion when, it comes, when election season comes around. We'll talk about it right now when there is no presidential election and, uh, and, and, and fight against it right now and, and uh, pray for an abolition of it. So when you hear people talking and you, the Holy Spirit will just reveal sometimes their agenda. There are many false prophets in this world. This is how we know they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person is the Spirit of God. If someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the Spirit of Antichrist. Specifically, chapter 4 is obviously dealing, we think, with Gnosticism, which was a very prevalent and a damning heresy at that time. But fellowship with Jesus produces a clear understanding of truth. Next, fellowship with God produces greater love and destroys fear destroys fear. Now, by this point in the letter, we've seen several. We've skipped a couple. He has said that we should love each other, I think, seven times. But he's going to hit it again just in case you missed it. It takes 15 minutes to read this book if you're slow in reading. If you take, really take your time, 25 minutes, you're going to see in those 25 minutes, every two minutes or so, John say, you should love your brothers. You should really love your brothers. Well, okay, I love my brothers who have the same denominational term on the sign, who worship the same way, who read the same translation of the Bible. And he's like, no, no, no. This is how you know if they're your brother. Did they acknowledge that Jesus Christ came in a human body? Well, that broadens it. <laughs> I don't know if I have that much love. That's a lot of people. That's even the guy on TV who, who's not like me at all. <laughs> and he's on every Sunday morning. I, I, the, I, he and I, we don't really align at all, but he does acknowledge Jesus came in the flesh. Are you saying I should love him? You can ruin a lot of good illustrations I have. Now you should love him too. Do I have to love the brother who doesn't like me? It doesn't matter if he likes you or not. It matters if he acknowledges that Jesus came in the flesh. And once again, he hammers it home. Verse seven, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anybody who, who loves is a child of God and knows God. Verse eight, black and white. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. If you don't love one another, if you don't love your brother or sister, then you don't know God. Well, I, I've read the Bible through this many times, and, and I've been in church all my life. I was raised in church, and, and, and I got saved when I was five. Well, what are you talking about? Uh, I, of course I know God. Yes, but you're holding a grudge, and that grudge has turned your knowledge of God off. And that grudge is darkening your spirit. This is the essence, I think, for, from John's perspective of holiness, purity and love. Spending time with Jesus, you'll want to stay clean so you can have more time with Jesus. You can have greater revelation of Jesus, and you will love anybody who loves the one you love. If you love my son, I love you. If you give gifts to my children, I love you. Why? Because you're loving on the people that I love deeply. And if we don't love our brothers and sisters, if we don't love our Wesleyan brothers down here and our old regular Baptists who have no idea what they believe over here, if we don't, if we don't love uh, um, uh, the Bible Fellowship that's down here, if we don't love Living Waters Baptist that's on 2nd Street here, that's all in our subdivision. There's a lot of churches in the subdivision. It's crazy. Uh, if we don't love them, then we don't know God. And what a, what, a, what a horrible thing to be said about a church. They don't know me. But we worship well. We know the songs. We teach the word. But if you don't love your brothers and sisters, then you don't know me. And this produces, the fellowship of God produces a greater love and then destroys fear. Um, verse 18, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because God loved us first.
Number 12, fellowship with Jesus produces victory over evil through faith. Verse 4 of chapter 5, for every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. Who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Victory over evil. It's interesting. He said in chapter 2, I'm writing this to those of you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle over the evil one, right? And then chapter 5, to the same people he's writing this letter to, he says, continue in your love so that you'll have victory over the evil one. So it's a, a prophetic, I'm writing to you who've done this, now this is how you do well, what I've said you've already done. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's, he's aligning, he's setting for them um, what, they are, what, their, what their goal is and what they're going to accomplish. Number 13, fellowship with Jesus confirms the testimony of Jesus. When I spend time with him in my heart, I begin to see who he is. I begin to see him do the impossible. John spent time with Jesus, and in spending time with Jesus, he saw who Jesus really was. At first glance, you could say this is circular reasoning. If I spend, if I spend time with him, then I'll believe in him. Don't I have to believe in him, spend time with him? It doesn't work. But John understood that he had, and he, by seeing the one and touching the one, I put my hands on him, I put my ear on his heart, and I heard his heartbeat. He understood that as he spent time with Jesus, Jesus said things, knew things, and did things that only the Creator could say and know and do. So when I spend time with Jesus, it confirms his testimony. When I spend time with Jesus, his word comes alive, and I watch his word become truth. I watch his word as living truth, and it confirms who he is and what he has written. It's getting away from him. It's journeying away from him and not being in his word where we begin to doubt its truth. But when we are in the word and we're watching the word give us life, there is no doubt about the truth and power of God's word. The attack on the church to not assemble, the attack on the church to be fractured, to be uh, in a, a thousand different denominations in a million different locations, the attack on the church is an attack against unity and it's an attack against presence because when you are present, then you have this confirmation. When the body assembles, the body sees the body and believes in the body. The body of Christ assembled is a great Great uh, um, supplement for our faith. As we see the body assemble, hear the body worship, see the body inhabited by the Spirit, then all of a sudden we know this is Christ. He is coming, and we are gathering and anticipating his arrival, and we earnestly desire that he would come, and we commit ourselves to purity until he comes. We are holy through him and from him in fellowship with him. So fellowship with Jesus confirms the testimony of Jesus. And then lastly, fellowship with Jesus secures our prayers and secures us from sin's destructive power. Uh, so verse 10 for, for point number 13, it said, all who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts this testimony is true. Faith produces a knowledge of the truth. And then the last one, securing our prayers Verse 14, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Verse 20, second part, and now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. He's the only true God and he's eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Sincerely, John. <laughs> Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Assuming that God has his rightful place in your heart, keep him there, is uh, how John wraps up the letter. A letter all about fellowship from someone who knew what it was like to be Jesus' best friend. What a, what a beautiful picture of uh, how time with Jesus keeps us pure, hungry for the Lord, and loving uh, the bride, loving our brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.